somebody, because I've asked you guys to send me videos you want me to comment on, and somebody sent me this video uh, to comment on. It's called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting. The guy's very well-spoken and looks like a really successful guy. And um, so I thought, you know, this would be a good one to talk about. And it's, it's particularly relevant right now. So what he does is he, um, he takes questions from people and he answers them. And the questions are particularly, uh, I guess, from white people. And he answers them from the perspective of a black guy, right? And uh, so we're going we're gonna to look at this video and we're going to analyze it. And we'll see if I, uh, let me find it. There it is. All right. There it is. Uh, he, he's got a bunch of these videos. Not that many because I think he started recently. Uh, he also brings people on the show and has uh, discussions with them. I haven't watched those videos yet, but it looks like those are interested. But anyway, this is the first show where he is, uh, he is presenting the scene. Now, let me just start by saying, the whole approach, the whole approach of white people, black people, white people asking black people, black people asking, I mean, that whole approach of looking at things from a collectivistic perspective, looking at things from solely from the prism of color, from the prism of race, is a recipe for disaster. Nothing good, nothing positive can come from this. This is a recipe for more racism, for more uh, discrimination, and, and really for more collectivism. Because the whole approach is from the perspective of race, from the perspective of collectivism. And, and unfortunately, this guy is uh, guilty of this. When asked on a different show, not this show, whether he would like to see a world of color blindness, he says no. He says, you know, something about color is beautiful and differences in culture are beautiful and so on. But that's not the point of color blindness. And let me just say, my view is we should be color blind when judging the character of people. We should be color blind when judging the quality of a culture. The character of people is not determined by their race. The culture is not determined by race. People should be judged by their character as individuals. Culture should be judged by whether they are pro-life or anti-life. Pro-human values or anti-human values. Pro-human progress or anti-human progress. And color of skin, the geographic location of the culture, has nothing to do with any of those. Anyway, so I thought we'd uh, we'd watch this and analyze it, and um, we're going to start with the first question he gets. He has a little intro, which I'm skipping, and we'll start with the first question he gets, which is about riots, so it's perfect. Emmanuel, why are you all rioting? I understand protesting, but why riot? And to that, I submit this. Uh, MLK said that rioting is the language of the unheard. For years, black people have tried peacefully protesting, going back to 1965 and before with the Selma March, and that didn't work. And that didn't work, so he keeps repeating this. I find it interesting that there's a complete, there's this assumption that the Civil Rights Movement just didn't happen. That no progress was made in the 1960s. That we still somehow live under Jim Crow laws that they're still being asked to go to the back of the bus. I mean, it, it not only is an injustice to the heroism of those who struggled to get rid of the Jim Crow laws and to bring about the recognition of the rights of blacks, particularly in the South, but really all over the country. Remember, things like uh, 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 redlining were government policy Government policy, even in the North, even in California. So getting rid of government discrimination at the federal and state level was a real achievement, a major achievement, a major achievement of Martin Luther King and, and, and many of the civil rights leaders of the time. So if you start from the assumption that 
we're still in a sense in the middle of the civil rights era. That is, 70 years later, nothing has changed. Everything is the same. Then yeah, I, I, that should lead to unbelievably frustrating frustration. Wow. We've been fighting this battle and we're still being discriminated by the federal government. We're still being discriminated by the state governments. But that is just a straight evasion of the reality. Now, we'll get to the fact that there's still racism out there. But the reality is, the reality is that a lot was achieved in the 1960s in terms of racial equality. And, and by the way, as you know, I don't consider race as a legitimate, legitimate concept. I use it here as they use it, as everybody else uses it. But I don't believe race is a valid, valid category, a valid concept to, to differentiate between people. But the idea that nothing has been achieved, nothing has changed, is just absurd. The 1960s civil rights movement led to the dis, to complete dismantling of Jim Crow. It led to the complete elimination of the laws that discriminate against blacks in America. And indeed, and tragically in my view, tragically in my view, and part of the problem today, the 1960s civil rights movement actually led to laws at the federal level that discriminate in favor of blacks. Affirmative action is a great example of that. Equal housing, uh, inability, inability to discriminate on private property, which violates private property rights in the name of anti-discrimination. So the civil rights movement, while dismantling real discrimination, also brought about what people call reverse discrimination which I think has perpetuated the idea of race, has perpetuated the importance of race, and has perpetuated frustration, resentment, and brought us to the point where we are today. But that they ignore completely. Because that is a reverse form of discrimination. And I find it you know, tragic that this guy who looks like he's, I don't know, his late 20s, maybe early 30s, or maybe his early 20s, I don't know, is not aware of the massive progress that is made. Today, to say you're racist, most people, 90% of people look down on you if you say you're racist. And good, that's progress. In the 1950s, many people in the South said unbelievably racist things, considered themselves racist, and it was a point of pride. The difference is dramatic. And by not recognizing that major progress has been made in this country with regard to treating treatment of blacks, you are weakening your own position. You're weakening your own stand. And you're excusing the kind of violence that should never be excused. There is no excuse for riots unless you're launching a revolution. And then it better be for the right cause. It better be for more liberty. So let's, uh, let's keep listening. And then in 2016, Colin Kaepernick, he took a knee and that agenda got moved to a flag, which was never the goal. He just wanted to raise awareness on social injustice. So that didn't work. And so now we've seen riots. I mean, if there's social injustice and, and, and there is racism out there, there's no question there is racism out there, though I don't think anywhere near to the extent that they claim there is and, and to the degree that they claim there is, but there is racism out there. Is the way to do it, is the way to deal with it, is the way to solve it through violence, is the way to solve it through rioting? And what is the agenda? If the agenda of the rioting, if the agenda of the demonstration was a revolution to, 
to bring about true colorblindness. That would be one thing. But we've seen what the riots are aimed to do. It's to destroy the system. It's to destroy capitalism. It's to destroy freedom. It's to destroy businesses. It's to destroy property. And to annihilate the system that we have that is the United States of America. I mean, that's explicitly what they argue. Trevor asks, uh, if riots persist in leftist cities, is it more for governors to enact better stand-your-ground laws, which would result in more deadly force being used in protecting property? No, I think I think the solution is not for governors to say, we give up. We're gonna let we're gonna let citizens protect their own property. I think if riots persist, then the solution is to bring out the National Guard and to arrest people in mass and to keep them in jail for longer periods of time, to prosecute them, to try them, and to put them in jail. The solution is not for the government to say, we want anarchy, we want people to go out there to defending their own property, and everybody's their own cop, which would create massive mayhem, like we saw with this guy walking down the street, whether he was protecting property or not, with a semi-automatic rifle and two people got killed. And he could have easily got killed. The solution needs to be for the police to actually do their job, for the government to actually do their job, for people who are in charge of law and order to actually provide us with law and order. Not to default on that by saying, no, 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 we can't do it, you do it. Somebody says that, that, that uh, again, uh, Super Chat, I would suggest that these incidents are mostly the result of hiring policies over decades. Maybe. But then we need to reform the police so that the hiring de- uh, policies moving forward are changed. And maybe in some cities, in some places, it makes sense to fire all the police and to rehire new people on the basis of better standards, as was done in places like Georgia, the country, when they wanted to eradicate uh, uh, corruption among the police. All right, I want to get back to uh, today's discussion of um, of rioting. So his point is, it's never worked. Civil rights movement didn't work. Colin Kaepernick's taking a knee didn't work. Because black people and hurt people are trying to get the attention of the oppressor. They're trying to raise, raise awareness of the oppression. So here's the problem. The problem is that you view people as monoliths. You you view people as collectives. We, black people, are trying to raise the awareness of the oppressor, white people. But that's not the issue. The issue is some white people, some police. The issue is not that we live in a country that's fundamentally racist, even though I think there are a lot of racist people in America, more than I thought in the past. So, somebody says, you're not white, you're on, you can't emphasize in any way. We'll get to that, because there's a sense in which that's right. There's a sense in which I cannot emphasize, and, 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 I'll, and I'll get to that. But the only way to solve problems like this, the only way to get out of this long term is to change the orientation from us versus them, them versus us, them as a group, we as a group, they did this to us and I, we, and start talking about I and me and you. I am not an oppressor. My skin color has been three white. I am not a racist. My skin color happens to be white. You are not a rioter. Your skin color happens to be black. We've got to get away. We've got to get away from treating people as members of groups. We've got to get to the point of treating people as individuals. And we're a long way from that. And unfortunately, videos like this do not help us get there. 
do not help us get there in spite of what I sense is real sincerity from this guy. Uh, I was in, uh, I was biking around Lake Austin the other day and there was a white girl around about 50 years ahead. Weird analogy he's giving here. And as I'm on my bike, I say to her, on your left, because I want to notify her I'm coming so that she can change her course of action. I get 10 meters away and I increase my voice. On your left, because she had yet to move. I get five meters away and she's still there and I say, on your left, because I realize if she doesn't change her course of action, there will be a collision. And as I approach her, I yell, on your left, and we collide. My goal was never to hit her, but because she had her headphones in, she didn't hear me and so she didn't change her course of action. So the idea is that American culture has their headphones in. And blacks in American culture have been telling us, change your course, change your course, change your course. And because we've had our headphones in, we've been dealing with other things. We haven't paid any attention to them. But what does it mean to change your course? Have blacks in America been saying, be individualists. Stop discriminating. Stop the racism. Train police better. Here are five things that need to be done. Ten things that need to be done. And of course, there's no evidence, clear-cut evidence, empirical evidence, that the police shoot black men more than they do others. But this country does have a history of racism. And I believe has a lot of racists in it. But how do you deal with racism? You don't deal with racism by being a racist. You don't deal with racism by being a collectivist. You don't deal with racism by saying, you're all racist. We need to change the system. We destroy what we have. We need socialism. or We need, I don't know. What is the solution? What is it, what is it that they're trying to, to gain our attention for on a bike it's easy you change your lane but what does it mean to change a lane when it comes to these issues they don't tell us because changing a lane is far too dramatic what they really mean is either they don't know i think that's the more innocent of them and the more serious of them what they mean is much scarier it's way too scary and they know it I believe that that's the same thing black people are doing now. 1960s were yelling, we're oppressed. And there, was a, and there was a consequence of that. Something was done about it. Don't evade that. But the course of action wasn't changed. And so we again yell, we're oppressed. Course of action was changed. Whatever oppression you have today is significantly, on a scale, on, you know, on, on, a, on, on orders of magnitude different than it was in the 1960s. You are today not systematically discriminated against by the state. Indeed, you could make the argument you're systematically discriminated for by the state in hiring, in education, higher education, in other formats. So all this anger, all this frustration that I understand actually exists. If this is the attitude, nothing has changed. Everything's just as bad. Nobody ever listens to us. That's just nonsense. But the course of action wasn't changed. And so again, we yell, we're oppressed. And now you see the collision that's occurred in America. So while I don't condone rioting, and I'm sure you don't either, because for the most part, Black people and others that are looting and rioting destructively, they're burning down their own homes. But when you think about the five different stages of grief, you come up to one stage, which is called anger. And sometimes emotions, they don't know their actions. So he's not condoning the riots, but he is excusing them. He's giving them a justification that does not belong. He's giving it a justification that is not right. He's giving it a justification that doesn't work. If racism is a problem, anger will not solve it. If racism is a problem, rioting and burning down your own homes doesn't solve it. If racism is a problem, 
Emotion is not the solution. Emotion and, and, and being a slave to that emotion. Giving in to that emotion. Acting out on that emotion. For your own destruction by burning down your own home. Or the homes of your neighbors. Of the homes of the businesses that serve you. It's not only not a solution. But it will make the problem only worse. And acting out like this doesn't cause people who are racist or might be sanctioning racism or might be even inadvertently promoting racist policies. It's not going to change their minds. It's going to make it worse. Violence in this context can only be appropriate if you're truly trying to change the government, to change the world, to establish some kind of revolution. But what kind of revolution do they want? I remember my mom, when I was a child, she lost her, she lost her sister. And I just remember her yelling and screaming. And I come outside my room and I see my mom throwing herself into a wall and I'm wondering what happened. And my dad tells me that my mom's sister had died. Thinking back on that, throwing yourself into a wall, it's not gonna change anything. You're actually harming yourself. Yeah, but sometimes pain and hurt, it doesn't know how to express itself. So teach it how to express itself. Focus your efforts on teaching people how to express their anger, their frustration. And maybe, maybe, if you teach them the truth about what their anger and frustration should be, focused at, maybe then you'd have a more constructive solution because this cannot be this cannot be an adult solution to the problem. This is a little child throwing a tantrum. And if you're a little child, you'll be treated as a little child. And that will not solve anybody's problems. Don't excuse the rioting under any circumstances. It is not excusable. No matter what the ultimate circumstances of the shooting turn out to be, rioting is not the answer. All right, before I go on, and I, I want to go on because there's some, there's some other segments here that I think are interesting. Um, we got 89 likes, 250 watch, uh, two dislikes. I'm not surprised. This issue always gets a few people who dislike my, what I think is a relatively nuanced position, and nuance is something people don't tend to like. But I'm sure there are more than 89 likes. So please, of the 220 people watching right now, Please go over and like the show if you get any value from it. It helps with the algorithms. It helps with YouTube. It's just a good sign when we have a lot of likes. It, it elevates the show up in the standings and it elevates my general channel up in the standing on YouTube. And we all want, hopefully, you guys all want the show to be successful on YouTube. So please uh, like the show um, and, and comment and participate. And the more engagement there is, uh, the more YouTube likes me, which means we get more out of the show, the more YouTube likes me. YouTube liking me is good, all right? Uh, let's see. Also, of course, don't forget to um, share. Uh, sharing is the most important thing you can do on social media. It is the way in which you can introduce new people to the show. And of course, those of you who really do get value from the show and, uh, and who uh, think that they should... Uh, provide value for value, trade, then uh, please support the show. You can do so on a Super Chat or you can do so on your onbookshow.com slash support on Patreon, on Subscribestar, on Locals. And thank you for the hundreds of people who actually do support the show. Uh, it's it's amazing how many people, uh, how many people do support the show and uh, how generous many of you are. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Let's keep going. I, there's there's more that this guy has to say, and you know that that I think is worth is worth hearing. You know, another question I get from my white friends, they ask me, "Why do you think white privilege exists?" By the way, um, the whole notion of thinking of people in terms of white friends, brown friends, green friends, white, black friends, is bizarre to me. Is bizarre to me. Again. The more you make race an issue, the more race will be an issue. I have friends. They have a variety of different skin tones. 
a variety of different skin colors. Who cares? That's not what defines them. It's not what makes them who they are. And I'm suspicious of people generally who think in terms of, I've, that, I've, I have some Jewish friends, I have some non-Jewish friends. I've, you know, what, what, what the hell? Stop focusing on my white friends, my black friends, my green friends. You know, that's, that's exactly the problem. And again, the more, oh wow, Richard, thank you. The more, the more we focus on race, the more we talk race, the more we emphasize race, the more we categorize people based on their race, the more we put them into groups and tribes and racial identifiers, the more racism we will have. The more racism we will have. No question. No matter what your motives are, and, and again, I get the sense that this guy has positive motives. And I say this, if you and I were in a race and the official at the start line, they held me back for the first 200 meters and you had a 200 meter then head start, the only way to level out that race is to either stop you from running or put me on a golf cart and catch you up and catch myself up. Well, you see, what we've done in America is we have simply said, OK, Emmanuel, you're now free to run. And we've acted as if it's a fair race when in all honesty, Black people were held back for hundreds of years. And so if in the late 1960s we say, okay, black people, you can go now, that's not a fair race. LBJ, he said it best when he said, you can't shackle and chain someone for hundreds of years, liberate them to freely compete with the rest, and still justly believe that you've been fair. Now, that's pretty interesting, right? The analogy, right? Because in a race, if you give somebody a 200-yard advantage, foot advantage, whatever, then we all know that's not fair. And if you hold somebody back purposefully, that's not fair. And we know that Jim Crow laws were not fair, and slavery was not fair. But what is, what is the problem with using the analogy of a race? For economics. Now, by the way, just as an aside, this guy is, an Im- is the son of an immigrant who came to the United States. I don't know exactly when, but came to the United States after Jim Crow laws are gone, after slavery no longer existed. His family was not held back. Indeed, my guess is that the reason his family came to the United States is because he had more opportunities in the United States than any other place on the planet. The reason they emigrated here It's because even though he's black, he had amazing opportunities. And indeed, we know that blacks from Caribbean, blacks from Nigeria, blacks from Africa, they've done, over the last few decades, done phenomenally well in the United States. But why is an economy not a race? Somebody says, because it's not a pie. Yes, because it's not a zero-sum game. It's not a race. It's not a race with winners and losers. An economy... Is a place in which we trade. Yes, some people make more than others, but they only make more than others by making more for others. Somebody wins when I win. In a sense, everybody wins their own race. You're not running against other people. You're running against yourself. You're trying to maximize your own ability. And indeed, somebody else running ahead of you faster makes it easier for you to do better. This is why the whole analogy breaks down, because it doesn't make any sense. As I've said many times, we've all benefited enormously from the Jeff Bezos and the Bill Gates and the, and, the, and, the, and the Steve Jobses of the world. Our lives are better for that, even though they won the race. I'm not a billionaire. They are. And yet we're all better off. So the idea of looking at races in terms of, again, groups, collectives, in terms of they're ahead, they're behind, they're winning, they're losing. No. Your life is your responsibility. Make the most out of the trades you have an opportunity to do. And if, if you are barred from a certain profession by law, if you're prevented from participating in a trade by law, or if the culture is so bad that you cannot trade with people because they are such racist, then yeah, that's something to complain about. And to the extent that there's racism in America, yes, that's something to complain about. But this is not a race. This is not a a zero-sum competition. 
This is not a good analogy. And by the way, it is true. It is absolutely true that the fact that the United States of America is held back through slavery and then through Jim Crow, the black population, that it excluded it from certain activities, professions, access to certain benefits. The fact that we have done that, that we did that, that the, this country did that for decades, that is a travesty. That is unbelievably unjust. That is horrific. But what is the solution to something like that? It's to get rid of it, to stop it, to treat people like they should be treated with equal rights, to take away the barriers for opportunities. And yes, the children of those people who were freed for the first time are going to struggle. It's not easy coming out of slavery. It's not easy coming out of an environment like Jim Crow. And it's a struggle. And that's tragic, but it is a reality. There's no way to fix that reality, unfortunately. It's hard. But the more you hold on to the fact that you are a victim, the more you hold on to the fact that the reason you have not succeeded in life is because your great-great-great-great-grandparents were slaves, the more you hold on to the fact that you don't not succeed in life because 70 years ago there was Jim Crow, the less you will be successful. The less you will be able to run, not that race, run that whatever it is, your life, your career. The more you believe you're a victim, the less happy, the less prosperous, the less successful you will be in your life. If you want to maximize opportunities for people who were once discriminated against. What you want to fight for is freedom. What you want to fight for is individual rights. And what you want to fight for is individualism, the antithesis of racism, the antithesis of collectivism. What you want to fight for is that people be treated, not equally, in a sense of treated one-on-one -on -one equally, but based on their character, based on their ability, based on their qualities, based on their qualifications. What you want is capitalism and its defense of property rights, capitalism and its defense of individual rights. And it's tragic, tragic, for them, for all of us, that over the last 20, 30 years, particularly I'd say over the last 12, 15 years, this country has been moving steadily away from individualism, from rights, from freedom, from maximizing opportunity towards greater and greater collectivism tribalism, limitations of opportunity, closing gates, closing opportunities to people. Instead of people like this, articulate, smart people like this, fighting for privatizing education so that their children, their, their, their family's children, and the people they care about's children can get the best education possible. Instead, they're writing and burning down towns and cities across the country. All right, um, we've got a bunch of Super Chat questions here. This is great. Thank you all. Keep them coming, particularly the ones $20 or above. Um, let's keep going. There's still one other point that I want to I address that he makes. So white privilege is it's having a head start due to hundreds and hundreds of years of systematic and systemic racism. That's just bizarre to me, right? I mean, 
there have been hundreds and hundreds, uh, arguably uh, well over a thousand years, of systemic anti-Semitism. And I come from a Jewish background, for whatever that means, for whatever that's worth. My ancestors were discriminated against. They were harassed. They were, you know, they were killed. They were murdered. They were slaughtered. Most of my family were killed in the, in the Second World War, in, in, in the Holocaust. But before that, Russian pogroms, and on and on and on. My family was slaughtered and butchered, going back 1,200 years, 1,500 years, 2000, over 2,000 years, really. Do I carry with me the baggage of that? Has that impeded my ability to be successful in life? I mean, you can make the argument that my family would have been richer, but that's me. I wouldn't have been richer. Is my success in life dependent on my success, on my father's success, who's dependent on his father's success, who's dependent on his father's success? And of course, it's not true of this guy, the guy talking. Again, he came here from, as far as I know, from the Caribbean or his parents. They came here, why? Because the opportunities. What about blacks who come from Africa, who do very well in America? I've told you, I think, before that the most educated nationality of Americans in the United States today are Nigerians. They're the most educated Americans. To, you know, if, you, if, 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 if you're going to be, if you're going to in, instill in people the idea, not only, not that they are victims of people acting against them today. I mean, that there's a solution to. We can solve the problem of racism or, or Jim Crow laws or, or, or problem today where there's somebody is mistreating somebody else. That can be solved. But if you're a victim because for the last several hundred years you're being mis your ancestors were mistreated, you're not being mistreated right now, but for the last hundred years you were mistreated. There's no solution to that. There's no way to stop that. There's just no way to solve that problem. I cannot go back in time and free the slaves. I cannot go back in time and get rid of Jim Crow laws. This is the reality we have. How do we solve it? We solve it by treating people as individuals, which both would get rid of racism and create massive economic opportunities for everybody. But that, of course, is the last thing they want. And... It's the last thing anybody wants. So both sides, all sides of this argument, unfortunately, rely on collectivism, statism. It's having a head start intrinsically built into your life. It's not saying your life hasn't been hard, but what it's saying is your skin color hasn't contributed to the difficulty in your life. Now that's a different argument. Now, if you can say that a particular individual's skin color has made his life more difficult, then I have sympathy for that. And I would like to know why. And that is a problem that we can try to fix. And it's the problem of racism in our society. But your skin color, you have to show how in your life your skin color has made your life harder. And the fact that my skin color has not made my life harder, although you could argue that my Jewishness has, is not a privilege. That's the way it should be. Privilege is something special. Privilege is a grant given to you by the state. No, nobody's skin color should matter in their lives. That's where you want to get to. That's the point you want to achieve. But the more you emphasize skin color, the further away you get from that. So yes, I would like to live in a world in which nobody's skin color made their life hard. That skin color was indeed irrelevant for anything important in life. For anything in life. Why just important? For anything other than, you know, I don't know how many vitamin C, how much vitamin C your skin absorbs 
and whether you're susceptible to skin cancer or other cancers or whatever. Skin cancer should have no relevance to anything other than, you know, medical issues. I live in an affluent neighborhood in Austin, Texas, and if I ever go to my mailbox and I see a white woman walking up to the mailbox, I consciously sit in my car because I don't want her to feel like I'm a threat. Now that's sad. And if that is true, that is very sad. And, and this, is, this is where I want to sympathize with this guy a little bit. To the extent that black parents have to have a talk with their kids about how to deal with the police. To the extent that a black man is truly afraid to go out into the street because a white one might feel afraid of him. To the extent that he feels like he will be discriminated against. Or to the extent that he thinks that something bad will happen to him just because of his skin color. Whether that is justified or not, you don't know that he's a lying person. You don't know anything about him. But, but it's, it's, it, part of the problem is that that is your first response rather than sympathizing. If that is a reality, that's not good. To the extent that there's a reality out there, and, and look, you hear this from blacks in this country a lot. It's not just him. You hear it from successful blacks. You hear it from conservative blacks. That there is a conversation to be had with their kids. That there is an issue. At least they perceive this to be an issue. And that's sad if that's true. And that's something that something needs to be done about. Again, the thing to be done about it is to fight the racism behind it. It's to change people's ideas about race. Writing is not going to solve this. Writing only makes this worse. I don't know why you guys flip out when somebody says that. I mean, if he was the only person in the world saying it, then okay, you could say he's a, he, you know, he's a liar. This, But everybody, but a lot of people say it. A lot of people feel it. A lot of people think that. And if that's true, that is sad. If that's true, that is bad. That's true, that affects all of us. And to the extent that there's racism in this country, and there's no question in my mind there is, then that needs to be dealt with. We need to fight against the racism. If I'm on an elevator with a white person, I try to hit the button first and get off the elevator first because I don't want them to perceive me as a threat because I realize Sounds like at a any point in time, type. whiteness can be weaponized. We saw that this past week. Amy Cooper, Central Park, the woman who called the cops on a black man. Good example. This is a really good example. She's This woman, Amy Cooper... Not a made-up story, real story. Wanted her to leash her dog because it was illegal to walk your dog without a leash. And she used two words that are a death sentence for black people. When she called the cops, she said, there's a black man who's threatening my life. Both of those things, as far as when you compile them together, were a lie. Because that black man, he was a bird watcher. And while so many people saw that incident and they were heartbroken, I, as a black man, saw that incident and was reminded of 1955. Emmett Till, 14-year-old boy, who was lynched, mutilated, and killed by two white men because a white woman made a false claim saying that he flirted with her. In 2017, that white woman recanted that story. In 1956, the two white men that killed him, they got off. And they admitted that they did it because they knew they couldn't be charged again due to double jeopardy. Now, note that he, he contradicts himself here, right? Because that's the progress that we've made. The fact is that the woman in Central Park was embarrassed by what she did. The fact is that the woman in Central Park apologized for what we did. She was prosecuted for what she did. The fact is that, she, that the black man was not lynched. That there was a lot of understanding towards that black man. But it's also true that it happened. That it happened. He was a bird watcher. Being, the police being called on him because he was black. So, 
You can say there's no racism out there. You can say he makes all this up all you want. But the fact is that there's a significant percentage of the population of this country that, fe- that fears that their skin color would get them in trouble. Skin color would get them in trouble. How is that right? How is that good to live in a country where a certain percentage of the population thinks that their skin color can get them in serious problems? And you can dismiss the woman in Central Park as somebody in the chat does, as a Karen, which is a stupid way of dismissing anything. But it happened, and it's real, and it didn't happen in a void. Some stuff like this happens every day. People out there are racist. Implicitly. Even when they don't think about it. And that's what needs to be dealt with. And the way to deal with it is not to dismiss it, to ridicule it, to say he's a liar, but to bring it back to the principle. And the principle is we should treat people as individuals. And if there are people out there who don't treat people as individuals, if there are people out there who are racist, whether they're white, whether they're black, whether they're Hispanic, whether they're any color, then those people should be dealt with. Not necessarily legally, but by us, by our society. We should not be tolerating racists of any kind. We should not acknowledge racism. We should not promote racism. You don't ban it. You speak out against it. You shun people who exhibit it. You avoid having any association with people who are racist. I've told you this, you know, a long time ago. I, you know, there's very few things that people do that I believe are as irrational as to be a racist. It's why I won't, I won't tolerate it. I won't support it in any way. It's why I won't participate in the stupid, I don't know, IQ arguments and debates. I mean, I will participate in them to say that they're stupid, that they're irrelevant, and that they only promote the worst in people. Racism must be eliminated. Racism must be eradicated for the face of the earth. We must argue against the racists on this chat, YouTube chat, and in everywhere else in our lives. And that means we need to argue about racism wherever we see it. Whoever preaches it, whoever practices, doesn't matter. What we need today what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages, and to the role of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want, to see, I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes but uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show, 
at yourownbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for all, for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.